as the nights get shorter and the days get colder. Heat pumps are often pointed to as the solution for cheaper, more sustainable heating. But this relies heavily on how efficiently they can operate. Too low and the old school gas boiler will still beat it. This is why a man named Adam Chapman set out on a quest to get heat pump efficiency higher than anyone thought possible. And it worked. Adam's own heat pump has peaked at 800% efficiency. He also founded HeatGeek to maximize the efficiency of as many heat pumps as possible. And I wanted to know how they do it. To get to the bottom of HeatGeek's high efficiencies, I went to their offices to chat with Adam on all things thermodynamic and SCOP, or seasonal coefficient of performance, and learn all of their not so secret secrets. Also, just to say I'm not financially linked to HeatGeek in any way, I just came across them because they were dominating the heat pump leaderboards, which is apparently a thing. So who actually are HeatGeek? HeatGeek are a community of the best heating engineers. We give uh, just a place for them to communicate and share ideas and training for that industry. Yeah. Uh, and any heat pump installations that um, uh, happen through us as part of our network, uh, we record and our efficiency average is a SCOP uh, or efficiency of 430%, uh, including hot water. That's all out to 500% efficiency and uh, that's much higher than the average efficiency of 280% by some way and it's quite basic stuff with a few little tricks in there uh, that pretty much anyone can learn it's not necessarily me it's just it's us uh, yeah nerds geeks being geeks on social media and sharing the best tips and tricks That's it. okay so how does a heat pump work and what do efficiencies over a hundred percent really mean a heat pump transfers heat from one place to another using electricity in heating mode, it pulls heat from the outside air and moves it indoors to warm an enclosed space. Even when it's freezing outside, there is still thermal energy in the air because temperatures above zero degrees Kelvin or absolute zero still contain some heat energy. A refrigerant circulates through the heat pump system, absorbing this heat, even at very low temperatures, turning it into a gas and allowing it to transfer heat to the indoors. So heat pumps move heat rather than generate it, which is why they can achieve efficiencies over 100%. This is based on the amount of electrical energy they consume versus the amount of heat output they provide to a home. The efficiency of a heat pump is measured by its coefficient of performance, or COP. For example, a heat pump delivering three units of heat for every unit of electricity it uses has a COP of three, which is effectively 300% efficiency. Now the SCOP metric, or seasonal coefficient of performance, accounts for seasonal variability and averages the COP throughout the year. To keep things simple, we'll stick to SCOP in this video and see how it can go all the way from 2.5 up to 5.5. When I started looking at heat pumps, I thought the increase in efficiency would be found inside the heat pump itself. But when I met up with Adam, I learned it's really down to systems thinking. We looked at how SCOP can increase on an efficiency pyramid, with the most important factors being at the bottom, which we'll be working our way down to. I just wanted to add that these SCOP figures are not exact calculations, but more illustrations based on Adam's experience. The top layer involves having a decent heat pump from a leading brand, which will give you a SCOP of around 2.5 with no other real considerations. So you'd be getting 2.5 units of heating for every unit of electricity used. But that's just the start. The next most important thing is that the person who's living with the system uses it in the best possible way. Mm. And that's basically to understand that uh, it's not necessarily best to heat in short sharp periods low and slow is often better even accounting for the fact that your property could be losing more heat uh, the analogy i normally use is a car it's imagine two cars from land's end to scotland one's driving 90 miles an hour and stopping the other's doing 30 miles an hour they both get there exactly the same time mm. but one's obviously used a lot more fuel i mean it's really yeah. simplistic for your channel but no no no, they, my, you know, no not at all they, they sort of uh analogies are the best to, helpful, to get stuff 100% I, I always try and find ones exactly like that this analogy of driving your car slow and steady to be more efficient is where the bigger picture comes in 
you need to consider how the heat pump and heating infrastructure in your home all work together. All in all, this takes us to a SCOP of around 3.2, but to raise the SCOP into the realms of 3.7 lies within the pipes and valves. How are we now jumping from 320% to 550% yeah. yeah, yeah. is a huge jump. <laughs> yeah, now this is where the magic well, happens. Well, and these are the secrets. Well, they are the secrets, but it's nothing. These are very basic principles. Yeah. And this is um, uh, this is what sort of empowers uh, uh, anyone to feel like they're doing something a bit more in society. Mm -hmm. It's to understand these basic concepts. Uh, really, here we're looking at the next step is the how the systems piece together. Yeah. So it's the pipe work that's between the emitters how the pipework's connected and the volume of water within the pipework, all of that makes a difference. Mm. Using things like plastic pipework means you have to use inserts in the fittings, which re uh, increases resistance to flow. We want ease of flow around the system. Mm. Um, so we want to be using uh, copper pipe, ideally it has a bigger internal bore, the uh, uh, radius of the bends are more, um, a, a, a larger radius. Okay. So uh, you get easier, uh, better flow around the system. Uh, the pump doesn't have to work as hard to get around the system easier to balance the system mm. and balancing the system is where we're sharing the heat specifically between the different radiators uh, that can be quite tricky and if you don't get it right you do start to shave off some efficiency with a scop of 3.7 things are looking good but we can do better but before looking at that and onwards to over 500 percent efficiency here is another home energy system that you should be considering the Anker Solix X1 is the perfect home energy storage system to give you and your household power independence and become free from unwelcome power outages. This independence can also save you money by allowing you to use cheaper electricity when you need it. Its storm guard mode prepares for outages by charging to maximum capacity upon severe weather alerts and can switch to backup power in less than 20 milliseconds when needed. Though you might not notice as it can run high wattage home appliances simultaneously without a problem. The Anker Solix X1 can also operate efficiently across a huge range of temperatures thanks to its thermal controller technology. Its modular pack design also allows for expansion without added losses and features an energy optimizer which ensures you get the most out of your investment by minimizing capacity loss. The minimalist design is only 5.9 inches thick, ensuring it blends seamlessly into your home setup. With smart energy management, you can also maximize savings by utilizing green energy more effectively, and thanks to Anka's comprehensive app, monitoring and optimizing your home power usage has never been easier. If you're looking for more independence and lower energy bills, check out the Anka Solix X1 using my link in the description. Now back to heat pump efficiency. The next thing you can do to raise efficiency is take into account the outside temperature to optimize the temperature of the water flowing around your radiators. This is done using a heat curve graph and modulating controls. Heat pumps use, uh, uh, should be using weather compensation. However, most heating systems use on-off controls. Mm. On-off controls are where you reach your target temperature in the house and you shut down the call to heat to your um, your heat source, mm -hmm. whatever the heat source is. Um, that's great, uh, but very old, and we're in 2024. Why we send an on-off signal, binary signal? There's a lot more information we can uh, take from A to B. And so if you can do that, you can tell it specifically how many uh, points of the degree off target temperature or above or below. Mm -hmm. If we can send that information back, you can uh, send a modulating signal back to maintain temperature rather than hit temperature turn off Drop a degree, turn on full blast, turn up, turn down, turn up, to, yeah. and go around. It's that circuit. accelerating car again. Exactly, right? So uh, if, if we give a bit more detail, a bit more information, uh, we can help just keep that accelerator, see what where the road is ahead mm. and keep it at the right level. Uh, the way we really look into the distance, uh, because there's a thermal lag, that thermal inertia has time in it. We don't put the thermostat inside, or we can. We put the thermostat on the outside, or temperature sensor, I should say, on yeah. the outside. And by measuring the outside temperature, if it drops quickly by a degree or two, there is a time lag between indoors. So mm -hmm. if, it, if it drops a degree or two, if we know it's dropped a degree or two, we can um, be proactive with our heating control rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. If real reactive, you have to overcompensate with even higher flow temperatures, yeah. lower efficiency. Uh, if we're proactive, we can just bump up just to where we need to before ahead of time and just maintain that uh, 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 steady in energy in energy out. Um, kind of ratio. So uh, this is all based around what's called weather compensation. 
uh, and um, that's going to get you from, uh, where were we, 3.7. Yeah. That's going to jump you up to 4.3. Wow. Okay, so yeah, huge, yep. huge boost possible. Proactive, not reactive, right energy at the right place at the right time. And that just it. keeps that, you know, whole thing as steady as possible. Perfect. Now we're reaching the bottom of the pyramid where the most important factors are. So far, we've got a good quality, slow and steady heating system with good pipe work and valves that accounts for the weather conditions outside. To bump the scop up to 4.8, however, we need to consider the hot water tank. Hot water is normally parked as a thing that's, oh, that's inefficient. We don't really look there because mm. it's just going to be inefficient. We'll just focus on the heating. This has been a big mistake for a lot of uh, installation companies and um, uh, just society in general when it comes to looking at uh, heat pump installations. Here we're thinking about things like sizing the hot water as large as possible means we can store it at lower temperature because the density doesn't need to be mm. um, uh, 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 as high. So although you may only need 100 litres for such a small house, you might give it 200 anyway, you can drop that flow temperature or drop the store temperature right down. Right. Thereby, you can also drop the flow temperature from the heat pump right down yep. and climb up that efficiency again. Because we're looking at overall efficiency, not just heating. And in, in that as well, our specific designs around the cylinder itself, uh, we've uh, designed a super cylinder, for example. It's got a super large coil inside, yeah. which means the heat pump can run even um, uh, more cooler and slowly and uh, extract more efficiency um, out, of the, uh, out of the system. So am I right in thinking as well that the reason we'd want a larger volume of hot water at lower temperature is because if you have a smaller volume at a higher temperature, you're diluting it down with cold water. So you, you have enough volume of 40 degrees Celsius water, which is what people actually want, you know, the, so storing a larger volume at a lower temperature is just, I mean, it's better for it. losses, but it's better for getting up to that temperature in the first place. Exactly that. Um, uh, that, that that's exactly right. So the average shower is 38 to 40 degrees Celsius. Yeah. You don't really need to keep it hot, hotter than that unless there's Legionella risk or yeah. you know, other factors, which it's a whole other, you know, uh, subject to, to drill on. But that's exactly right. And the final and most important step to reach the stellar heights of efficiency well over 500% is to correctly size the radiators and heat pump, which is done by measuring the heat loss. HeatGeek actually let me play around with a tool they've developed using the LiDAR on an iPad, which really shows how the technology is coming into play. It creates a virtual model of the house so heat losses can be accurately measured. Having an accurate heat loss and sizing the unit, it's important for the heat pump size itself. And it means you can accurately size your emitters to as low a temperature as possible with the minimum disruption. And that is how you're going to get to 5.5 scop. Right. Or for your heating, 6 scop, 600% efficiency yeah. without the hot water. Which is why I guess underfloor heating, because you can run it at such a low flow temperature, you can then have a massive surface area and release it but then the trade-off there is where we sort of i always think of it as entering the real world is like do you really want your whole floor disrupted for that time when for a tiny drop in scop you could actually just have a decent sized radiator uh, in your house so me and adam continued to geek out about heat pumps for hours during my visit there is a lot to know about heat pumps and heat geek know a lot so make sure to check them out and you can even see the data for Adam's house online, which had a peak coefficient of performance of eight or 800% efficiency in September, 2024, when considering space heating on its own. I did see an interesting blog about how the seasonal coefficient of performance values aren't everything as a high scop value doesn't necessarily mean low running costs. Although this is true, if we are assuming a basic level of insulation and home comfort level, I do think it's a useful metric to compare the quality of heat pump installations. I'm sure new breakthroughs will come out in the coming years, with refrigerants being a major area of interest. However, for now, the main focus should be on the installation process. At least here in the UK, the government need to make sure the financial support they're putting into this is going into the right place, helping people save money and lower their emissions. What I found fascinating about HeatGeek is how they're using data and empowering people to get to grips with the thermodynamics and improve heating of their homes. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to keep notified for future releases and check out some of my other videos like this one on a floating wind turbine. And as always, thanks for watching.